Welcome back. I guess we're at the start of week four, huh? If you're keeping track, getting so far into it that it's kind of hard now to, to keep track. So that's probably a good time. Little rain in the forecast. Maybe that'll make us study as we get, get ready. You probably already know this, but maybe I better throw it out there for your remembrance. Uh, when is your test? Yeah, next Wednesday. So it's still nine days out, so that's still lots of time to do this. Uh, I hope you were able to take my advice and start working into Chapter 4 to the point that you got stuck. Uh, I suppose if you didn't get stuck and you finished it, that would be great news too. But uh, Or maybe if you got almost the way through and didn't get stuck, that would be fine too. But I was hoping you kind of worked as much as you could into Chapter 4, even though Chapter 3 is only the chapter that is the due today. But the sooner, as I kept saying, the, if you can get into Chapter 4, uh, the better off you will be. You will find out how these problems are kind of detailed, how they're all fitting together between chapters 1, 2, and 3, and they all coalesce right here. And I trust many of you have. There might be a few of you who haven't, but now, really, you've got to get into chapter 4. If you haven't started chapter 4 now, that, I mean, you got to need to turn chapter 3 and you need to get in there. You only have 9 days then left to... Uh, get this, uh, make sure it's under your, your belt. And who knows, maybe it, maybe it won't be a tough for you, but, uh, but I fear it might be uh, for some of you, and you need to just give that a try first to see if that's the case. So that's why I keep giving you those warnings. So here's what we have today. As you know, we've been working in Chapter 4. Didn't quite finish uh, mentioning everything about Chapter 4. I was doing some abstract examples about projectile motion and didn't save quite enough time at the end to talk about our circular motion or a relative motion in completeness. We did a little bit, and that's where I want to pick up. So probably take about 15 minutes more to kind of show you a few more things at the end of Chapter 4 that I, that I wish I had got to last Wednesday, and uh, then I'll call it good, and then I'll, then I'll open up the back of the book and just do examples. And I, I forget how many I've written uh, down here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven good examples. And so we'll just do as many of those seven as we can today. And maybe that will flow into uh, Wednesday, uh, perhaps uh, not. Uh, probably because I want to make sure you're well prepared then for the, the test. The schedule has us going to chapter five on, on Wednesday, and we will. Uh, just maybe not at the very beginning, but I will at least do want to uh, touch on uh, chapter five, kind of get some of those... Uh, simpler things and kind of the, the loose end things done just to remind you of Newton's three laws of motion. That's what chapter five is about. So I'll re-remind you of, of those. And so you'll, you'll see those. Uh, and my point here is we won't do anything new in chapter five because I don't want it to get in the way of the exam, but get enough into chapter five that then after the test we can dive into some of the new stuff as we put our calculus together with our uh, 102 physics like we've we've been doing. So that's kind of the the game plan. Anyway, so basically it's chapter four this week. I've uh, got the holiday uh, holidays, I guess, coming up, and so Friday is no school and uh, Monday is no school, and so. I'm sorry, Mon Mon yeah, Friday and Monday, and so that's why I won't see you uh, next Monday, and that's why uh, next week, Wednesday, will be the exam in instead of on, on Monday. Hope that makes sense. So I'll give you a little bit of extra time there, yeah. Don will still be here on Friday? Uh, you know what Don will probably do? Um, I didn't even think about asking him. I should have, so I'll give you two days, but, but let me check with him today, and if you want to know in lab, I'll, I'll have you go check with him in, in lab, but well, I'll definitely put it on the board for Wednesday's class. But uh, usually in a situation like this, uh, what he'll do is just do a focused review for you guys, perhaps on the Monday of the, of the break instead of the, the Friday. So it won't be the two classes and it won't be in so much of an open session, but he'll probably do it in here and say, hey, let's do a, a review on, on Monday. So there won't be a, anybody around because classes will be, but, but pencil that in. I don't want to put any words in Don's mouth, but most likely that is the, the situation on that, uh, on that Monday. Uh, a little different, I should make sure, I, I think I said this on the first day, but I just want to make sure it's real, real clear as you get prepared for the exam, still, still nine days away here. 
but unlike 102 there's no you know no little note no little cheat sheet and uh, hopefully you're seeing that there's not really that many equations anyways it's the deductive reasoning of working them out that's the the hard stuff there so but no little note little no little cheat sheets and unlike 102 there's no multiple choice kind of thing but I think you realize that there'll be just like the homework problems it'll it'll be a test with with five problems on it and you'll do problem one you know turn the page and there'll be problem two turn the page there'll be problem three and four and then and then five so that's the the layout of the of the test well unless there's any questions about it I'll say the rest of that we were working here you might remember remember this uh, this is what I was trying to show you. We did some uh, similar triangles, a little bit of calculus, and came up with this picture again with the proving the V squared over R part of it. But this is that picture that you'd want to keep in your mind here. It's the same picture I showed you in 102 that when you have an object that's moving, um, how it responds to an acceleration and then later a force which leads to that acceleration uh, depends upon the direction of that acceleration. What is the direction of that acceleration compared to the movement of the object? And so we break it down into three categories. That's why I keep asking, you know, where's that accelerator on your car? And just the general design of a car is perfect because it breaks it down into the three pieces we like to study. One piece could apply a force, or I shouldn't use force yet, that's coming up, but apply an acceleration in the direction you're moving. And if you apply an acceleration in the di direction you're moving, what happens? You go faster, right. And so that's what this picture is trying to represent. Over here, what if you apply an acceleration opposite to the direction you're moving? you go slower. And so we studied that more in chapter 2 than we did in this chapter. This chapter now gives us the last possibility here is what if the force or the acceleration is then perpendicular to the direction you're moving? What does that do? Yeah, it makes you turn. So you don't go faster, you don't go slower, you just go around a turn. And so what we left off was an object going in a circle at a constant speed. So how can you accelerate and still go at a constant speed. Answer, you turn. And there is a force on, excuse me, there's an acceleration on you of V squared over R. So that acceleration and connected with the speed and the radius all play together and figure out, okay, what is your acceleration or what is your radius of your turn given your speed and your acceleration. So that's where we had left off. The one more step, or you might even say, two steps here. The one more step here is what if, and maybe I'll even change colors here, what if I have something that looks like this? What does that acceleration do? Yeah, and hopefully this isn't hard. This is the whole point of chapter three and going through the vectors was you can think of this as made up of a component that is perpendicular plus a component that is parallel. And once you have that, then you can say, well, this part of it is making it go faster and this part of it is making it turn. And so an acceleration like this is how we would get this picture. And so if this picture was on the test or the homework, you would say, what is happening to this ball as it's going around the turn? It's speeding up, right? This is a non-uniform circular motion. An acceleration like that has a component that is perpendicular, makes sense, that's why it's turning, but it also has a component that is parallel to the motion. And if I came over here and said the acceleration was something like this, you would say it is, yeah, making the object go slower as well as making it turn at the same time. And you can figure out how much it is going slower by using our vector analysis, using our how much of that vector is in the direction that the object is moving. And then you could say how much of the vector is perpendicular to what it is moving. And if you take those two, then you figure out whether this thing is going faster, you know, slower, turning. And of course, how much faster, how much slower, how much turning is where our calculations come into play. So 
that was kind of that last piece of the circular motion I, I didn't quite get to and uh, had kind of wished I wished I had I think it would have you know been a good place to kind of end up and uh, finish but with all that said I think the thing to do now is to let's just go through some examples and like I said, I, I, I hope that uh, you were able to work on some of these so that uh, as you see me work on them, hopefully they will, they will make sense up to a point. And then you'll go, oh, I don't know what I would do next. That's where I was stuck. And then hopefully my examples will kind of give you some insight into getting unstuck as you are working on, on your problems. And then by the time you watch me do my problems and you do yours, and we do a great one in lab today, Today is uh, one of my favorite labs. I think I told you that it's uh, certainly low tech. None of the fancy computers or the probes. We just launch a ball across the room. Uh, it used to be a lot easier. Now with so many students, it's a little more dangerous. So we'll, we'll have to be a little careful here and, and watch ourselves. We don't hit each other with it. But, you know, just sit across the room and, and, and see where it lands. And that's, that's the intent to kind of calculate where is it going to land. And, uh, you know, first you take some data to get enough information to figure out where it's supposed to land. And then, then you, you actually calculate where it should land and then you put a target out there and then you fire it and uh, see what happens. So it is uh, kind of fun, especially when it lands right on the target where you, where you calculate it. So it's just it's like, hey, all right. Or even close is still pretty exciting because then you can say, I think I got the idea. My partner made a measurement that was wrong, you know, type thing. But it, but it would have hit if my partner wasn't off by a few percentage points there. But other times they're just way off. I mean, you know, missed by seven meters. It's like, whoa, you know, I, so it's a good time to check your calculations here. All right, well, I like to do number 15 first. I think it's a good two-dimensional problem that uh, uh, is, is simple enough to get started. And uh, like I said, if you've, if you've been working on them, you'll, you'll notice this right away. Uh, if, you, if you haven't been working on them, then ho hopefully, you know, you'll you'll see the progression on this but here it says a a ball is tossed from the upper story window of a building the ball is given an initial speed of 8 meters per second and an angle that is 20 degrees below the horizontal it then strikes the ground 3 seconds later a find the find the horizon find how far horizontally from the base of the building does the ball strike the ground and then B find the height from which the ball was thrown and then C how long does it take for the ball to reach a point that is 10 meters below its launching level all right so again I just want to read it through all the way through the first time encourage you to do the same thing it's a good place to get started just read it all the way through don't try to remember the numbers just just you know get what I call the gist of the problem now go back and and, and read it sentence by sentence and maybe even phrase by phrase pausing and figuring out what what are they asking here and so as I go back and read it I'll draw a picture because I think again that picture is really useful for that first step get a good physical picture of what is going on so it says a ball is tossed from an upper story window of a building so here's my building maybe the windows right about here okay not sure how tall the building is I'm not I suppose it doesn't even matter I think we're gonna figure that out here in a minute um, but there's the ball it's tossed from this upper story. the ball is then given an initial speed of 8 meters per second at an angle that is 20 degrees below the horizontal okay so maybe I'll draw a little line for the horizontal there's the horizontal and maybe I'll put a little arrow here I'll put a little V sub I to say, okay, this is the initial velocity. It is thrown out the window. Now, not completely straight, horizontally. In fact, down, as they indicated here, down 20 degrees. Okay, and that speed is given to me as 8.00 meters per second. So, again, that's the part in the reading that I was, I was saying. Take your time, read it, pay close attention to what they've given you. And, of course, what they haven't given you is just as important and then what they're looking for. 20 degrees below the horizontal. The ball strikes the ground three seconds later. Okay, so given the information that we have learned, and I'm going to assume the ground is level. Ooh, I, I think the question would have been a little bit better had they actually said the ground was level. Don't like to assume anything's in here, but um, I know it's gonna launch someplace over a little bit later, and they tell me it's three seconds and I I think I will need to know that the ground is is level so I'd call that a little maybe a little flaw here in the in the problem um, 
hopefully that won't happen on your test question but it could and if it does you know please ask you know yes I mean level ground and I'll try to clarify that but as I draw this picture we talked about it last time what shape does it have it has a shape of a parabola okay we proved all that and went through some uh, deductive reasoning there okay and so here's the ball and it does clearly say it's three seconds after being launched it, it hits the ground so here's the picture I have so far and then the question begins a how far horizontally from the base of the building does the ball strike the ground so this is what they're asking for right here how far is that right all right, well, I'll pause because here's the first thing. You got a good physical picture of what's going on? All right. And, and I kid you not, this will solve a lot of difficulties. More difficulties than you realize. You won't even go down the, all these wrong paths that if you look at somebody else doing it, it's like, well, why are you doing that? I mean, look, if you draw the picture, blah, 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 you know. So it really helps to have a good physical picture. Physical pictures really stop you. That physical intuition can go a, a long way. All right. So, so here's that picture, here's that physical intuition. The only thing is, physical intuition is experience, you know, and so it takes a while for that to kind of build up. That's why we do all these, these problems. I think I told you, the, the homework, I like it, it's kind of self-correcting in the sense that uh, you look at the problems and you go, oh, that's quite a few problems. But if you really know what's going on, you'll race through those problems. If you don't, it'll take you a long time, but that's what you need. A lot of time on the homework because you don't have a full understanding of it. And so the, the homework is a nice, nice balance but because of that. All right. But as it said, you know, here's the problem. And I think I do got that first step. I'll even go one step further. We, we had the connection between position, velocity, and acceleration. Remember all those, the derivatives? Okay, I don't even have them on the board now. But remember those set of kinematic equations with constant acceleration, those two? Okay, keep that in your brain here. Because I need to ask, is this a constant acceleration problem? Yes. Okay, it is, right? So I can do all that. What is the acceleration? Okay, good. So I hear both, right? It's two-dimensional. So there's two answers to the question about the acceleration. The acceleration vector is zero in the i-hat direction, and it's 9.8 meters per second. Whether we call it negative or not means we've got to make a choice, and the traditional choice is to call down negative. But maybe I should ask, is that what you want to do? Okay, most of you are saying yes. And I'm glad to see some of you are saying no. I'll stick with the tradition because I don't want to confuse anybody. But doesn't the ball go down? The speed is down? I mean, everything's down here. I mean, couldn't we avoid all these negative numbers if we just call down positive? All right, but as you said, let's not. Okay, so you feel more comfortable calling down negative. We'll stick to that. And so there's the, the negative. But just remember that. Now I'm making a choice. I should probably make a, a, a second choice too. Where do you want to put the origin? What gets launched? I mean, that's what we were doing last Wednesday. And again, I, that's what your author does. And there's a lot of good to that. Um, I would say this problem has some other thoughts. Uh, putting the origin here isn't so bad. And putting the origin there where it lands isn't so bad. And so all of those will probably have an equal amount of uh, benefits. But since we did, you said it first, and uh, your author in the lab today, when you launch it in the lab, puts the uh, launching point as the origin. I'll, I'll, I'll stick to that. That, 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 you know, might as well be consistent with that. But I do want you to understand you don't have to. It's your choice. That's what I want you to see here. I want you to make sure you're not just doing the math, you're reading the math. You're, you're stopping, you're thinking about what does each term in the equation mean, and so now that gives you that skill of saying, well, what happens if it is a little different the next time, right? And so in this case, we'll stick to this one, and that, 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 that's the traditional, which is down is a negative, origin there at the, at the launch point, all right? So I've answered that. I've got constant acceleration, good. I've got the origin at the, at the launch point. And so what are we ultimately looking for? Well, how far is it? So we're looking for what you would might call X final, right? Where does it land? So it's, so it's starting here at X equals to zero, fair enough? And that was the uh, advantage of picking the origin there. The initial or the starting points 
of the ball are, are zero. And so those four kinematic equations that have now been doubled, so those eight kinematic equations, can now be viewed in this, this way, and uh, we can put in then our values that we're going to need in those. Um, do we also know things like the initial velocity in the x direction? Yeah, well, what is it? Yeah, is it 8? It's not just 8, right? It's what? Yeah, good. It's the 8 for the magnitude times cosine of 20 degrees. Right? And again, that's what the chapter 3 was all about. Maybe I'll change colors into green if that helps here. But you can think of this vector here, the initial speed going at 8, as made up of how much horizontally and how much vertically. And it is the cosine of the 20 degrees that is this part, which is the part that is adjacent to it. And so there is my initial speed. So again, don't just put an 8 there. A uh, common early mistake, uh, but you know, hopefully you, if you've been working on these, you saw that after a one or two errors, or now you see it. So this would be my velocity, initial velocity in the x direction. Same thing can be said about the y direction. What is my initial velocity in the y direction? Okay, good. It's not 8, right? But it's 8, that's magnitude, times sine of 20 degrees. And one more thing, negative. Don't mix that one either, right? Magnitude, component, direction. Should I come back to the picture here, right? Why negative? It's down, right? This ball is angled downwards. So the velocity in the y direction is down. And, and we chose down to be negative. That was our choice there. We had that freedom of choice. We chose it. Now it has power over us. So we've got to stick to the negative. Okay, and so we, we want, a, want a negative there uh, for our, our velocity. So, I'll say it again, magnitude, the component, and the direction. And I really did the same thing here. Here's the magnitude, here's how I got the component, and the direction was positive. I didn't address it, only because I wanted to wait until right here to see what you would do. But you've got to take a look here. Is it a positive or it is, is it a, a negative? Alright? Now, you could argue, well, since this is measured from the x-axis, then I could use my fundamental mathematics and say it's the sine of negative 20 degrees and don't put a negative. Fair enough, you, you, you could. Uh, and the sine and cosine would take care of the plus or minus sign, uh, only though if you measure from the x-axis. And that was my warning back in chapter 3. Although that's true, we don't find that as useful. So we realize that a lot of times we don't measure the angle from the x-axis. So you're better off, I think, to look at the picture. And you'll particularly notice that in the next chapter. Look at the picture. Look at the angle. You decide whether it's plus or minus. You decide whether it's sine or cosine. And just use always an angle between 0 and 90. And then, of course, this is the hypotenuse. This is the magnitude. So magnitude, component, direction. It was, it was and there was 20 Okay, so the question is, what if it was above at 20 degrees? So if it was angled above at 20 degrees, then I would say in the vertical direction it's going up, so there would be a plus sign here. Everything else would be the same, yeah. And that would still be the same, but that would be a plus sign. So that's how it would be different between launching it down and launching it up, yeah. Uh, yeah, you, let me see. Uh, no, I don't think so. The, the, the negative 20 degrees without a sign here is relying on the mathematics, which isn't so bad, except that mathematic requires you to always measure things from the x-axis, and we don't always do that. And so I don't think it serves you well in more complicated problems coming up. I think what serves a little bit better it's looking at the picture, looking at the components. You look at the magnitude, you look at the component, you look at the direction. Look at each of those three and, and write it down and break it apart. 
Okay, so those are my beginning steps. Now I think I can actually answer this. I, I think I can solve for x because one of the kinematic equations for constant acceleration, that, that number two was final position is equal to initial position plus initial uh, velocity in the x direction times time plus one half acceleration in the x direction times squared. Right? And so I think I've got all those and I just got to put them in now and now it becomes this plug and chug type of, of problem. And you can see why then I chose it to be the first one. Uh, well I can put these in. Initial position, well that's zero, okay. Uh, initial velocity we just discussed, so that would be eight cosine of 20 degrees. And I, well, I'll put my units, meters per second, uh, because then we know it, it's in the air for three seconds. So that's the uh, part that says, okay, well, what, you know, what is the position three seconds later? Uh, the other one here is a one-half. I need the acceleration in the x direction, which is zero. Good. And so the rest of it is a waste of time. It all comes out to be zero. But it looks like then we've got 24 times cosine of 20, whatever that is. I can open my calculator. Whoops, looks like I got a little clearing to do. Hang on here. And I probably should check, am I still in degrees? Okay, all right, so, so 24 times cosine of, what do we say, 20 degrees? Good. And so about 22 and a half and a half meters. So there's the answer to A. Where does this ball land after three seconds? B goes on to say, find the height from which the ball is thrown. All right, well, hopefully you're seeing the same thing. Now they're looking for the Y, right? Y final. Now, you know, here we've got to be careful to remember where we put our origin, yeah? Uh, there are many ways to check it, so it's not just one answer to, to, to there. Um, I'm, I, I guess I'm wondering how much checking can you do? Of course, each level of checking goes back to make sure that this, you know, each step has to be correct. But I guess I'm wondering, are you asking, I mean I could just take that number, right, and put it back into here and solve for time and see if it comes out to be three seconds. Uh, that, now that's more of a check if I did my math correctly. Okay. Um, I would say probably at this point I would just by checking is more estimating. In other words, what if I threw a level? How far would it have gone? Well, if I threw it level, it's traveling eight meters per second horizontally for three seconds. How far would it go? 24, right? If I had thrown it level. Now, I didn't throw it level, so I don't expect it to be exactly 24. But if I did throw it level, I would get 24. So, so the, anyways, there's two checks here that I guess, I'm not sure which you were asking. If you're asking for a math check, I'd go back here and, and, and put my answer. Yeah logic check or my physics check is, a, is what I call an estimation. Let's go back and see if it makes physical sense. So I can look at some parameters and in this one I would say I didn't throw it exactly horizontal but pretty close to it. And a perfect horizontal throw 8 meters per second for 3 seconds would have gone 24. I expect it to be a little shy of 24 and sure enough I am a little shy of 24. So I feel comfortable with it, certainly. Yeah. I expect positive, I expect just shy of 24. And so those kind of reasonable logic guess, what I call estimations, are, are very useful. You know, if we were calculating the size of the atom and we went all the way through and came up with 10 meters, we should probably stop and say, that's not reasonable. But, but, but this is. Yeah. 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 Okay, comes back to here. Here's the projectile. You throw something. Okay, what does gravity do to it? Pull it down. So does it have an acceleration down? Yes, what's its value? Well, that's the 9.8 that we measured in lab. Haven't really proven it to you, although that's when we get to Newton's laws, we will explain why. Right now we're more describing what it has. So I'm, I'm by description, by going to the lab, by telling you it's 9.8, we know it's 9.8. Now that's one direction. What is it horizontally? How much does it get pulled horizontally? 
Zero. So what's the acceleration horizontally? Zero. So I've got the two accelerations. One for the horizontal, one for the vertical. And this calculation involved the horizontal, so I put a zero. But this calculation is going to involve the vertical, so I'm going to use the negative 9.8 as you'll, as you'll see here. So good. And that's a real good question. It is a, the very common mistake that I see people putting the 9.8 in with the horizontal motion. Or putting the zero in with the vertical motion. So we want to keep those separate. X is with X, is Y is with, with Y. Okay, so B, as you correctly indicated, would be right here, a, a vertical motion. So, again, it's the same equation because it's only really the same type of question. Uh, the question is, what is the height of the building? Or, sorry, the height of the launch point, not really the whole building. But from the motion of that ball, we, we, we should be able to, to get it. Let's see, what's the initial launch point? Do we know that? Yeah, some of you are saying we don't know that. Be careful. Yes, we do. If you say you don't know it, then I think you've forgotten where you put your origin. Where did we put our origin? At the launch point. So what is my launch point? Zero. That is the position that I have launched it at. Okay, and for those of you saying we don't know, I have a feeling what you are doing is mentally, without realizing it, taking your origin and putting it down here and saying, well, I don't know how high it is. No. You're changing your origin on it. And, and that could lead to troubles. Now, I'm not saying it couldn't be done because you probably could move your origin here if you just make a conscious decision about it. That's fine. But, but there's my point. You've got to be thinking about what you've done. You're reading the map. Okay? Are you, you know, what little steps have you, have you done in your, in your head? And if you're going to leave your origin there, you do know the initial launch point is zero. What you don't know is the final point. But would this number be positive or negative? <coughs> negative. So I expect it to land down, right? And I've been calling down negative. So in my estimation of guesses here, I expect a negative number. If I get a positive number, I probably have done something wrong here and mixed a couple things together. But the way I have it set up, it better come out to be negative. And then I can put in my initial velocity. Well, that was that negative 8 sine of 20 degrees we talked about for 3 seconds. And so... We're going to get so many meters and negative from that. And then we'll have our one half minus 9.8 meters per second squared here. And then we'll have three seconds squared there. Okay. And so at this point, hopefully, once we've got everything set up, it, it really is just, you know, becomes a math problem now. It becomes a plug and check. I got the numbers. Put them in here. And so, like I said, in this case, it's negative. And also I'll go negative 8 times the sine of 20 degrees times 3. And from that, subtract 1 half times 9.8 times 3 squared equals. And I got a negative 52.3 meters. And so that tells me the final position of the ball. Or maybe I should say it as the position of the ball after three seconds. I, I doubt if that's the final position. It might bounce a little bit or some other things that go on. But after three seconds, that's where it is and that's where they say it hits the ground. So they're telling me this is down 52.3. Now maybe here's a little subtlety. The question really asks for what is the height of the, of the building. So you might give a final answer that's the opposite of this, going up instead of coming down. So probably a better answer is a positive 52.3 for the height of the building. You know, what is the height? And, you know, it, well, it's a positive number. It's going from the ground up. And uh, probably the question could be answered or worded a, a, a little bit uh, better. So not interested so much in the positive or negative, interested in do you know what the positive and negative mean? Do you understand your answer? 
Uh, because certainly somebody could have called down positive and come up with a positive 52.3. And in no way would I mark that wrong on the, on the test. I, what I would do is I would go back to their coordinate system and I'd look at their picture and I'd say, well, yeah, they've called down positive, so they got a positive 52. And then the next paper I grade has a negative 52. And I look at their coordinate system and they call down negative. I said, well, yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, as long as your, your, your picture, your coordinate system, and all your terms match each other, I, I don't care how you do it. it. That's just evidence to me. You know what's going on. It's when the things don't match, when you've got one answer and a different picture or different terms that have, you know, don't match. That's when I you know, start circling things and going, okay, okay. here's your problem. You're, you're, you're mixing your positives and negatives between this term and that term. And uh, it's going to get you to the wrong answer. So, anyways, and I think there's a C on this one, isn't there? Uh, yeah, C. Uh, how long does it take the ball to reach a point that is 10 meters below the level of launching? All right, so C, how much time does it take? So they're after time again here. Or I mean, this, sorry, they're not after time again. This is, they're after time. Last time they gave us the time and we had to find position. Now they're essentially doing the opposite. Aren't they giving us position and asking for time? All right. So help me out here. Which equation? And I say that as if there's only one way of doing it. Please don't ever think that. There's many ways of getting to this. Yeah, it's, a, it's the same one, right? It's, it's y final equals y initial plus initial velocity y times time plus one half a y t squared. So the same equation would be the appropriate one, just this time we know position and we're looking for time instead of knowing time and calculating position. So let's go through this. What's this? Is it 10? Negative 10. Very good. So we're going to stick to this coordinate system. It's 10 below. Okay, again, that's uh, that interpretation here. That's where you got to read into the problem. Make sure you're reading the math. Make sure you understand what's going on. They say 10 below. Notice they'll always say that. It would be a much easier problem if it said solve for the time when the position is negative 10 meters. You know, they give you the negative, you plug it in, you solve for it. It won't say that. Okay, that's too simple. Okay, you're past that stage. It will say 10 meters below. You've got to realize negative. If you chose negative, you may not have chosen negative. You may have chosen positive. Your choice. It's another reason why they don't want to say negative 10 because you may not have called down negative. Your choice. Okay, but it's definitely below. That's the idea. You've got to interpret your numbers here. And so the way we have set it up this time is 10 below is a negative 10. Initial position. Zero. Initial velocity. And time unknown. So there is our 8 meters per second sine 20 multiplied by time. Then our minus 4.9 t squared. So we have a quadratic formula. It doesn't surprise us here. So C is a little bit harder mathematically than, than A and B. Um, because of that, I think the math is harder. but but uh, the concept, hopefully, is, of, is about the same. Uh, maybe I'll rearrange this to a positive 4.9t squared when I move it to this side. When I move this, it's a positive, whatever 8 times sine is. I think we did that over here. Oh, we didn't actually work it out. Let me put a number in there. 8 times the sine of 20 is about 2.74. So this is 2.74t minus 10 equals 0. So there's my quadratic formula in standard form. So solving this for time, which is no different than we saw two weeks ago when we did chapter 2, quadratics all for time, uh, we've put the opposite of b plus or minus b squared minus 4 times A times C all over 2A. And we're going to get two times. We need to interpret them and decide which one we, we want here. 
All right, well, maybe I'll do all this quadratic stuff here. This is the 2.74 squared. That negative with that negative make a positive. Then it's 4 times 4.9 times 10, square root of all of that. And this whole thing, the radical part, is 14.3. And then, of course, we have the plus or the minus to choose from. Uh, we probably could rule the minus out right here from the get-go. Uh, it does have an interpretation, as I said uh, last time. We're looking for the time it takes for the ball to get right there, which we're defining time equals to zero when it gets launched. So we would expect the time to be greater than zero and less than three seconds. So there's our rough estimation here. Uh, to get in this position and always have an acceleration of 9.8 means it would have had to come from somewhere back here. And so there is a moment in time where that could have happened right there. And so here, pfft, negative time pfft, before it got to zero and another positive time when it gets to that same height. So there are two moments in time according to that equation, as there should be. But, th but this isn't really relevant for the problem. But of course, that makes sense why my math is giving me my two answers. Um, and I see that the negative one is not the one of interest here. So I'll just stick to the positive one. So I'll take the positive 14.3. Subtract the 2.74, then divide all that by 9.8, and coming in with 1.18 seconds, and good, as I thought, should be positive, and should be less than 3. Yeah. Is the reason they used uh, three significant figures on the 2.74 because it was 8.0 um, velocity? Yeah, now, I, yeah, I gotta admit, the general rule is use three significant figures unless they're indicating uh, otherwise. And, uh, and I didn't even... So if it had just been eight, you still would have added two to this. <sighs> yeah, I, I wish the book was as careful as you're thinking. Uh, the book on this problem did say 8.00. Right, yeah. So that's why you have to do <sighs> I'll say yes to that, but don't be surprised if you're doing a homework problem and they uh, say just flat eight. Okay. okay. And you look in the answer okay. and they have three significant figures. Okay. Okay, so they won't follow those hard and fast rules. Okay, uh, they won't follow the rules hard and fast. Yeah, because sometimes my answers weren't matching for those. Yeah, yeah, but uh, uh, over the years, these newer editions have been more rigorous with their three decimal places. So I probably should have also done 8.00 here. And I probably should. The only troubles I always have there, though, is this 9.8. What do I do here? Because it's 9.8, and that next one I could look up, but it's an average over the Earth, and it varies from place to place here. So it's a lot of times why we always say 9.8, and we don't like to say the next number because the next number is slightly different. Um, but it's pretty close to a 1, because I think, I think the average on the Earth is 9.806. And, uh, and, and that which rounds to a 1, and I think we're, in our area where we live, it's, it is even closer to the 1. So it wouldn't surprise me. And, and at which case, if I wanted to truly stick to my significant figures, I put, should put 9.81 there, and I should put 8.00. Zero. But as I said earlier, be reasonable with your significant figures. That's not the main lesson. Important that you keep to. I don't want to, you know, make it sound like it's not important. And I'm glad the, the way ours is structured that you learn your significant figures and adhere to them quite well in, your, in, in the chemistry sequence. And so we, I feel like you guys learn that and you learn it well. And that, therefore, in this class, we, we kind of turn a blind eye to that as long as we're reasonable and move on to the, to the physics and focus on the physics. Yeah. Well, yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. Certainly, certainly. You know, yeah, I would not come back and look at your exam and say, right here you didn't write the three. You wrote the three of the answer. You know, and I, there, of course there's no way I know how many you put in your calculator. Did you put 8.00 in your calculator? Or did you, I mean, you know, so that's, yeah.
that's that's not what that's that's about okay um, same thing can be said about units too you know if you don't include them in here that's not so bad but they need to be in your answer right you need to have units in your answer but if you don't carry them through in your calculation that, that, that's understandable okay and so if I don't do it you know I guess it's okay for you not to do it but please don't ever think by not doing it I'm not paying attention to it it's just that I understand those those are becoming easy for me and I've now moved on to some harder physics type of problem yeah all right well like I said hopefully that first one makes sense let's switch it up a little bit the next one kind of similar to this with a slight difference gonna get you to think a little bit and uh, actually the nice problem because it kind of takes me back to my childhood here and I guess I, I kind of like those Saturday morning cartoons which when I tell my kids about Saturday morning cartoons and maybe you guys are the same way they look at me like what what are Saturday morning cartoons do you guys know I mean, there was this no cable TV and, and uh, the Cartoon Channel. I mean, cartoons were only on Saturday morning. I mean, you wanted to catch a cartoon, you know, it was Saturday morning. The evenings, those were adult programs, right? News, I mean, kids were supposed to be out playing on the streets and getting into troubles and riding their bikes and crashing without riding a helmet and kind of things. You, you weren't allowed to, you know, be watching TV. So, Saturday morning was this time where, you know, if you're a kid, you got up at 6.30 in the morning and you could watch cartoons. Uh, anyway, that began to change and they had cartoons in the morning and cable TV and all that. Anyways, so maybe you've seen this cartoon. I, I, I trust you have, even though it's old. It was old when I was young, so I can imagine how old it is here. But it says here, number 56, that we have Wild E. Coyote. And Wild E. Coyote is trying to catch the road runner here. All right, so here we go. We got the determined coyote is out once more in pursuit of the elusive road runner. The coyote is wearing a pair of acne jet powered roller skates, which provides a constant horizontal acceleration of 15 meters per second squared. The coyote then starts from rest, 70 meters from the brink of a cliff the instant the roadrunner zips past in the direction of the cliff. A. Assuming the roadrunner moves with a constant speed, determine the minimum speed that the roadrunner must have in order to reach the cliff before the coyote. Then, at the edge of the cliff, the roadrunner escapes by making a sudden turn while the coyote continues straight ahead. The continues to operate, giving it a horizontal acceleration. B. If the cliff is 100 meters, uh, 100 meters above the floor of the canyon, determine where the coyote lands in the canyon and see, determine the component of the coyote's velocity upon impact. So a lot of words there, but you get the idea, I think, hopefully, the gist of it. Read it all the way through, okay, what is going on, and now come back and start looking at some details. So here is kind of that picture that they have there that we're up here on a mesa here's the canyon floor and what we have back here is 70 meters back they say from the brink of the cliff stands the oh no a coyote coyote what does a coyote look like uh, it's got a nose my ears and jet powered roller skates <laughs> legs Oh, it's kind of short. <laughs> All right, well, that's the best it's going to get. So here's my <laughs> pathetic coyote. All right, so here's the coyote, 70 meters away from the brink of the cliff, but re wearing these jet-powered skates, okay? Now, what happens? Da -da 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 -da, the coyote wearing these acne jet-powered roller skates provides a constant acceleration. Coyote starts from rest. Okay, did you catch that? All right, so he's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting, right? And then the roadrunner goes zipping by. He's at a constant speed here. So then we've got, uh-oh, roadrunner. Uh, roadrunner, 
kind of a bird, kind of an ostrich, right? Beep beep. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Is that a little better than the coyote? I, th I think that one's a little better than the coyote. Well, but anyway, so here's the here's the road runner. So we've got road runner. I'll put RR for road runner. COY for the coyote. And so here's my coyote, and it's going to go zipping by. And so the problem describes this way here, that the uh, coyote is patiently waiting, and eventually a roadrunner comes by. And as it gets by, then he starts these jet-powered roller skates, giving him an acceleration. And of course, <laughs> going to hopefully catch it. Now at first, I think you can see this picture, or can you? That is the key to the problem. Describe the motion of what you see is going to happen here if the coyote is standing here and here comes Roadrunner and now coyote starts the rockets. What happens? Does he go along with it next to it? Does he take off in front of it? Isn't the Roadrunner always going fast and then he's going to speed up? And so for a while there the Roadrunner is going to be getting further ahead until the coyote gets to the same speed, then the coyote is going to have more speed and can catch on it, right? And that's the idea that the coyote is then going to catch it. Now the roadrunner is timing it just right so that what ends up happening is as it gets to, he turns and goes over the edge, kind of like a cheetah or a gazelle being chased by a cheetah. You know, if the gazelle is smart enough, it's not going to try to outrun the cheetah. It's going to look behind it. As soon as that cheetah gets close, whoo, you make that quick dash and you go that way, right? And it gets no different than a fighter pilot, which is, that's got to be a weird situation, you know? You're flying along and your radio man behind you says, oh, a missile shot at us. Oh, that's good. Uh, you going to do anything? No, just going to fly here for a while. You know, well, I'm counting down. Four seconds to impact. Three seconds. You do it? No, no, no. You want to give it any gas? No, no, no. I'm just going to cruise along here. Three, half. And then, you, you know, you make that sharp turn. But the idea is to make that sharp turn. So, obviously, Roadrunner and Coyote is the same game plan here. And so that's the game plan is to get right there. And so hopefully that story helps because did I get the first thing across here? You got a good physical picture of the intent of the problem, what's going on? Okay? You've got to understand that. That gives you some information. It gives you information about distance and speed and time and, and how all these things uh, uh, fit together here. All right, so back to the problem here. It says here, here's A. Assuming that the ro roadrunner moves with a constant speed, determine the minimum speed that it must have in order to reach the cliff right before the coyote. Then at the edge of the cliff, the roadrunner escapes by making a sudden turn. Okay, so if I were to break this into two pieces, because I've got two objects, I would just say, okay, here's the motion of the roadrunner, and here's the motion of the coyote. And as I go to write out my equations, I guess I would pause here and say, is this a constant acceleration problem? Oh, good. Some of you guys, I would say, well, first of all, don't you have to say which object? I mean, we got two different objects here. Okay, so I'll go to the, to the Roadrunner. Is this a constant acceleration for the Roadrunner? Yeah, the Roadrunner is moving at a constant speed, it says. What minimum speed? Constant speed. So what's the acceleration on the Roadrunner? Zero. Yeah, so I could come over here and say acceleration, and probably more technically say the acceleration in the x direction. But I would say this first one is not even a chapter four type of problem. Is there any two-dimensional motion here? No, this, this, this right now is really one dimension. This is, this is a chapter two type of, of problem here. Well, what about the coyote? What's the acceleration in the x direction? Yeah, that was given in the reading as 15 meters per second. That's where you get this constant acceleration, this rocket you know, firing along, going to make this coyote go faster and faster and faster, and hopefully, from the coyote's perspective, hopefully gets the, the, uh, the road runner. So I know that. Um, and I guess I also need to pick an, a coordinate system, an, an origin here, so that I could, you know, start to answer this question. What is the initial position of the roadrunner? What is the initial position of the coyote? Well, where do you want to put your origin? Yeah, I th I'm thinking there, you know, right there makes a, a whole lot of sense in terms of setting up the problem because that's when the, the, every, all the action starts to, to take place. And they're at the same place when that same time happens. So, so that's really kind of convenient. Doing that, what is the initial position? Well, 
zero and, and zero. Okay, and I, to be honest, I don't know what else you would pick. I mean, that one, you know, nothing else really even makes sense in this one. That just seems like the obvious choice there. Okay. And so now as I start to, to solve this, I could maybe say something, well, what's the final position of the Roadrunner? Uh, yeah, if I'm talking about the whole movement here, I want that Roadrunner to go 70, and at that same time frame, I want the coyote to go 70, or you might say a hair less than 70. So if you want to use inequalities instead of equalities, I, I'm good with that. Maybe I'll do both. I'll, I'll put a greater than or equal to there and so, so when you go to solve your equations. Because we do want the, uh, you know, the time it takes for the coyote, coyote to get to 70 to be just a little bit less than the time it takes for the, uh, or a li little bit more than the roadrunner. We want the roadrunner to get there just a, just a hair early. We don't want them exactly the, the same. Well, now I think you, you, you got this idea. If I were to write out this equation with a constant acceleration, I would say x final is equal to x initial plus initial velocity in the x direction times time plus one half acceleration in the x direction times squared, right? So there is our general equation. It's kinematic equation number two. It's good anytime we have constant acceleration. We do in this case. It's a zero. But as we put in our numbers, we would put in a 70 here. So here's the final position of the coyote. The initial position is zero. The initial velocity in the x direction is unknown. The time it takes for the roadrunner to get there is also unknown, but the acceleration is not. So what I know so far, just looking at one of the objects, is this relationship that the velocity multiplied by the time is 70, but I don't know either of those. I don't know how much time it takes to get to the cliff, and I don't know what the speed is. In fact, that's the whole question. So the goal is to find this one, which tells me then if I can get the time, then I can come back over to there. And that's usually the key to the problem, because couldn't I get time from the motion of the coyote? So let's come over here and study the motion of the coyote. Once I get the time, I can put it over here and get the velocity of the, of the roadrunner. And so that's usually what happens when you have multiple objects. One object gives you information about time that can be used to think about the other object. <clears throat> and that's what I'll, I'll have here. So if I write out the same equation for the coyote, I have this. Again, same idea that the final position of the coyote is 70. The initial position of the coyote is zero. What about the initial velocity? Do I know that one? Now, I thought earlier we said we didn't know it. Okay, good. So don't mix your objects. Yeah, we don't know it for the roadrunner. Do we know it for the coyote? Yes, because they said the coyote starts from rest. So, yes, we, we know that one. Okay. And a good. Sounds like for most of you that was kind of a trivial question. So good. I mean, when you start to see all this, the, the questions I ask sound trivial. Stupid. Why would you ask such a dumb question, right? When we see that physical picture, that's what, what happens. But I tell you, that's what I'll see, is I'll see students mixing up velocities of the different objects. So keep track of which velocity of which object here. And in this case, I want to know the initial velocity of the coyote. That's why it's in this column. This is a 1 half, this is a 15, and this is the t squared there. And so there's the unknown. How much time does it take for the coyote to get the 70 meters when it has acceleration of 15 starting at a zero speed? And so after a little bit of math, I will get that time. And so I will take the 70 and multiply it by 2, divide it by 15, and take the square root of that, and get 305. So, just a hair more than 3 seconds, right? And so, I want the, the road runner to have maybe, you know, you might say a hair less than, than that. Um, and I, I guess that begs my question. Should I use the inequality or should I just stick to the equality and then whatever I get, you can say it's a hair less. Hair less? You like the, okay. Uh, I, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll do that and won't mess with the, 
inequality signs greater than or equal to. So taking this and putting it over to here then tells me that I've got 70 meters divided by 305 seconds is equal then to the velocity of the roadrunner. So 70 divided by that last answer, 305, comes out to be 22.9 meters per second for the velocity in the, the x direction. So there is the roadrunner. <clears throat> what is the velocity in the, in the x direction? Now, of course, that's exactly equal to, so, you know, as you can say, the rotor needs to be a hair more, needs to be greater than that. Greater than or equal to, well, not even equal, just greater than that, otherwise the coyote is gonna, gonna catch it. Not too much greater, otherwise the coyote will see your plan, you don't want to give that away. But, you think the coyote would learn by now, but oh well. <laughs> so there's the first part of the problem, and you can see, um, it really wasn't this chapter. It wasn't a two-dimensional motion. The two-dimensional motion part of it really starts now. Look at B. B then goes on to say, the cliff is now 100 meters above the flat canyon floor. Determine where the coyote lands. Okay, so extending this problem, now that we've gone over to here, the, the uh, roadrunner has kind of moved off I'll say to his left, you don't see him here in the picture anymore, but now we have this coyote <laughs> with these jet-powered roller skates. Whoops, now he's getting smaller. Uh, right here, going over the edge of the cliff. And I should probably draw a picture. What is it going to kind of look like? Yeah, it's going to look something like that and land down here on the canyon floor. What shape does it have? Parabola, really? Sure. Didn't we get a parabola for a projectile? Is this a projectile? Yeah, the jets are still working. And I think that the wording was important that they're jets. I heard somebody say, oh, the roller skates. It, it doesn't matter the wheels are touching the ground. These, these, are, these are jets. So are they, are they going to give you an acceleration in the air? Yeah. yeah. So are we going to have a horizontal acceleration here? Mm, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're still going to. So that's what makes this problem a little different than the ball one last time. In other words, when I would to come over here and ask you, okay, so here is B. What's the acceleration for B? Yeah, we've got 15 meters per second squared in the x direction and still the negative 9.8 meters per second squared in the, in the j direction. So this is why I'd say it's a little different than a projectile. A projectile had zero, right? And we proved last time that if it had zero, it would make the shape of a parabola. So we'd get a parabola look like this. And so that's why I said, hey, be careful tell you telling me this is a parabola. Because this doesn't have the same idea as what we proved something would have a parabola. Now notice I didn't say it wasn't a parabola. Because it will turn out to be, if you went through the math, to be a parabola that is shaped like this. <laughs> so it's a parabola tilted on its side. Let's not bother to prove that. So yes, it would have come out to be a parabola. I suppose the answer is yes. But I'm not sure we know that. We certainly don't need to know that. We just know, need to know this is a little different problem. And my hopefully the idea here is could you still solve it with the same logic? Yeah, we just don't have a zero acceleration in the x direction. And just hopefully the problem makes that clear. And it, and, and it does. Maybe I didn't read it as, as clear. But it definitely says, back there, it says the coyote skates remain horizontal and continue to operate while the coyote is in flight. Okay, and so they're trying to imply in there that, hey, don't overlook the fact that you're going to have horizontal acceleration. If it was just gravity by itself, you would have no horizontal and only vertical. But now, 
we have, have both gravity and the scapes. Okay? And now just go through the same logic. Very different numbers. And this just kind of illustrates. Here's a problem we've never done before. We've never done anything with a horizontal and a vertical at the same time. But could we do it? I, I hope so, right? We just got to go through that same logic, but now, you know, but now we have numbers in, in the horizontal instead of zero. Yeah. Sorry, why was there zero acceleration when you threw a ball out the window again? The, gravity does only this, okay? And, I, and, and this just comes from experiment at this point, okay? When I take an object and I pull it, which way is it pulled down? down. So it only has acceleration down. So what is it left right? Nothing. Okay, so zero left right. Okay, and so we have zero left right unless something like in this case a rocket is hooked to it, then it's going to go, you know, so it's going to have a horizontal acceleration and a vertical. So when you throw a ball while you're throwing it, it has a horizontal acceleration, but, but once you let go, there's no more horizontal acceleration. Yeah. All right, so. So anyways, I think you can begin to see now as we get into B, is this a two-dimensional motion? Yes. The coyote's going to do what? The coyote's going to move horizontally and vertically at the same time. Except I think in the real cartoon, doesn't he just go horizontal? And stops, right? And then he doesn't fall until he looks down. Yeah, so I, I don't think they want us to do that calculation here. That's, that would just be one dimensional. They do want us to do the, what, you know, what would really happen here in this. Uh, this. So, <laughs> yeah. And so it would, the motion would look something uh, like this. All right, so now that was the problem. Now I, I need to go back. I've talked so much I forget the question here. Uh, the cliff is 100 meters, so I should put that in my little picture here. So we're 100 meters up. And so we've got to fall 100 meters. And I think they made it clear that the, the floor is a level floor. It says the cliff is 100 meters above a flat floor in the canyon. Determine where the coyote lands. All right, so basically they're looking for this, right? How far over? Ah, oh, I'm so glad you asked. Now, where do you want to put your origin? Yeah, I would think in this case, let's move it. Let's not leave it the same place we had it in, in, in A. Or could you? Yeah. Uh, sure. But we've been doing so many of these problems where the launch point was, and we really didn't have two-dimensional motion, so I think it would be harder if we didn't move it. Now, th that's a judgment on your part. So I'll say it again. Do you have to move it? No. Would it be better, I think in this case, Although sometimes you never know until you try one and, and two and, and see how it works for you. But many of you are saying, yeah, let's, let's move it. And, and I agree. Let's, let's move it here and take advantage of this fact that we will then call this the new origin. And so it will have its advantages and disadvantages. For example, one disadvantage here is, do we know the initial speed? Right. What was nice about moving this is do we know the initial position? Yeah, so what's the initial horizontal and vertical position? Yeah, zero and zero. Yeah, and so I like that. That's, that. that's really, really nice here. Okay. And better still is this is when I can start my clock. Because this when it starts to fall. The math is really complicated if I realize I'm going to start my clock back here, but I'm not going to let it have a vertical drop till it gets here. And, 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 and that can just get an ugly in terms of the calculation. And so that's why I'm saying moving your origin makes a whole lot of sense. But here's that disadvantage, although it's not much of a disadvantage here. What is the initial velocity in the x direction and in the y direction? Okay, good. You see the easy one, I think. All right? In the y direction, zero. Hey, that, no problem there. But it's the x direction. Do we know that? No, but it won't be too hard to find as I see somebody pointing right there. Right? What are you thinking? Yeah, you're thinking, I know it took three seconds for the coyote to get here. So going back to part one here, we could calculate final velocity as initial velocity plus acceleration times time. And taking this as the origin for that first part, we had zero speed, we had an acceleration of 15, and we had a time period of 3.05 
seconds. So time is independent of, of where the origin is. Uh, time, time doesn't reset. Oh, well, yes, time does reset, but but um, how can I say this? Yeah, I, I know you're finding velocity there, but it does reset. Yeah, yeah. So time now is zero on this side. Right. Anytime we say initial. This is the position when time is zero from those right. equations, right? So I, yeah, so I am resetting time. Right, 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 right. So I need to go, right, I need to go back to part one to say, okay, what is that? Um, 45, uh, 75, why don't I just do three significant figures? So here's a 45.8 meters per, per second. So as I said, this is probably the disadvantage of moving the axis, but not that bad. So like I said, jumping back to part one, I know not only the time it takes for the coyote to get there, but also its uh, position, which I'm now going to call zero, and its new time is going to start over at zero, but that also tells me then it is already moving 45.8 meters per second when it gets to the, to the edge there. Which is obviously quite a bit faster than the Roadrunner, you know, which is what we would have expected. If you want to go back and do a guest estimate, we would expect back here that the Roadrunner takes off coyotes catching, and now coyotes going really fast. And so the coyote should be going really fast compared to the Roadrunner when they finally catch up. And, and, and sure enough, we've got this 45. All right. So I think those are the, the, I'll say the given stuff. Maybe I should call it the initial stuff. You stretching? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so those are the uh, initial stuff here. And now I think we can answer that. We can come back here and answer. Where does it land? And so they're after the x. So if I write down my x equation, I would say x final is equal to x initial plus initial velocity in the x times time plus one half acceleration x direction times squared. And so this is what I'd like to know. What is x? What is its final one? Now maybe if you're looking ahead you'll see, oh I don't have enough information yet. But if you don't see that, let's, let's keep working on that. You'll, you'll see. Do I know the initial position? Yeah, that's, that's zero when I reset my origin to the edge and reset my clock. Uh, do I know the initial velocity? Well, yeah, that's the 45.8 meters per second. Do I know how much time it takes before he crashes to the canyon floor? No, that's the part I don't know. If I had known that, then I can finish this calculation. But the way it's going to stand now is there's two, two unknowns here. So I can't finish it the way it is. But let me keep writing in my equation. What goes here? Yeah, one half of 15. And so I know we already pointed it out, but I'll say it again, just be careful. Because so many other problems, we had put a zero there. We had put a zero there because it was a projectile. This is not a projectile. This still has the roller skates on it. So it does have a horizontal acceleration. So what this would tell me is I'm looking at this saying, I'd love to find the position of this coyote, but I can't until I get the time. Hmm, any suggestions? Okay, so the vertical motion, right? Right, use the other piece of, of information. And so it's kind of like the first one, but the first one we got time from the other object moving. Here we'll get time from the other dimension it is, it is moving. So let me write that equation out here. So let's do the y equation. So this would be y final is equal to y initial plus initial velocity in the y times t plus one half acceleration in the y t squared. And so do we know the final position? Okay, good. What is it? Yeah, good. Don't forget the negative, right? It's negative 100 if you're going to put that origin up there and call down negative. It's going to land 100 meters down. That is a position of negative uh, 100. What's the initial position? What's the initial velocity? Zero. What's the acceleration? Yeah, negative 9.8 t squared. So, solve for, for time. Okay? By the way, I'll give you a helpful hint for today's lab. 
See how I use the vertical motion to get time? And now I'm going to use that time to get horizontal motion? That's the key to the lab here. So do the same thing in the lab here. When you have to calculate where this ball is going to land, in order to calculate final position, you're going to need time. Where are you going to get it from? The vertical motion. And that's what we'll, we'll be doing. Now we won't have a rocket on in the side of the ball, so the, the numbers will be definitely different. We certainly won't be going this fast and have these kind of distances, but it's, a, it's the same basic uh, idea. So that side of the equation I have 100, actually negative 100, and then I will divide it by a negative 4.9, and then I will take the square root of all of that and get about four and a half seconds. So 4.52 seconds then is the time it uh, is in the air, the coyote's in the air. And now once I know that, I can come over here and go 45.8 meters per second for 4.52 seconds plus one half times 15 meters per second squared times 4.52 seconds squared equals 45.8 times 4.52 plus one half times 15 times 4.52 squared equals 360 meters. Okay? You think it's a cartoon. It's a long way over there, right? So, there's the coyote. Three football fields. Well, getting close to four football fields at that point. Yeah. It's a long way over in a football field drop. C. Determine the components of the coyote's velocity. All right. So, what is the final velocity in the x direction? Well, this would be that kinematic equation number one, right? This would be initial velocity in the x direction plus acceleration times time. So, coming back over to here, we, we did answer that beginning part. Coyote started the edge here at 45.8. So, 45.8 meters per second. The coyote continues through the air with a speed, or an acceleration, excuse me, of 15 meters per second squared. For how many seconds? Well, that's what we got here. And 4.52 seconds. And so this would be one of the two components they're asking for. What are the components of the speed? So 45.8 plus 15 times 4.52 coming up with, oh I'll round it to 114. So we've got 114 meters per second in the horizontal direction. What would be the final speed in the y direction? Well, same basic arithmetic. Initial velocity in the y direction is zero. And now we would have a negative 9.8 meters per second for the four and a half seconds as the coyote drops. So 9.8, negative 9.8 times 4.52 gives me a negative 40. 4.3 meters per second. And so they're my components. They don't ask it, but I'm going to go one step. D. What is the magnitude of the speed of the coyote and the angle the coyote makes with the floor of the canyon? So what's his angle of impact? I mean, here comes this coyote and it's going to hit. Boom, like that. And so my question is, what is its speed and what is its angle? Yeah, I'll start with the magnitude of its uh, speed. If this is d, its speed squared would be the component. So we've got the horizontal at 114, so 
114 meters per second squared. And then we've got the vertical one at a negative 44.3 meters per second. I'll square that. Add them together and take the square root. That would be the magnitude of the speed. So 114 squared plus 44.3 squared equals square root of all that good stuff. And we're about 122 meters per second. So that's often the last step in a problem is to go back to the polar coordinates, not just leave it in the Cartesian ones here. Okay. What's the angle? Yeah, and so this angle then is some velocity vector. That velocity vector has a vertical and a horizontal. Uh, maybe I should do it in two steps. If I look at the tangent of theta, the tangent of theta would be the velocity in the y direction divided by the velocity in the x direction. And I guess these are final velocities since I'm talking about the velocity upon impact here. You know, what angle is that? So theta becomes the inverse tangent of, and my y component is the 44.3. Notice I'm just going to use a plus sign there. I'm just going to get the, a, a, a positive angle. I'm going to get it in the first quadrant, if you will. Just what is that, that angle? So it's 44.3 over 114. So inverse tangent of 44.3 over 114 comes out to be about 21 degrees. So 21 degrees is the the angle. And so it's a much smaller angle than shown in my picture. As you might expect given these numbers, I mean this is an enormous horizontal speed and then very little vertical speed. So this is, you know, going to skip off the canyon floor more than plow into it. I don't know, but that's a pretty narrow one. And for, part, for part C, could you have written the two um, factors, the two parts as a vector and written like 4.52 J hat plus 114 J hat? Yeah, yeah, you can write them, sure, sure, with, with I hats and J hats. And, 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 and probably even more welcomed given, given that that's the kind of right. notation we're trying to teach you here. Um, and uh, I just left them that way because the, the author specifically said the components. So I said, well, there's one component and there's the other one and done with the problem. Uh, and I just added this one because I thought it was more realistic of the problems you'll see in the future and thought it would be helpful. Well, anyway, there's two examples. Hopefully those were, were helpful. Should we try another one? Are they beginning to look the same? All right. And so I, I hate to say it quite this way, but uh, it does emphasize what I have there on the top of your syllabus. It's the same fundamental principle again and again and again. And so when you get to the point of being bored, if I may say that, it's like, you know, it's the same problem. He, he, all he did was change the numbers here. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. There's nothing here that you can't do that you haven't seen before. And when you start to see it that way, you're, you're, you're ready for the test. You're all, okay, now, now it's 15 instead of 7. It's a baseball instead of a football, you know, and it, there's just some changes, but it's all the same basic motion, yeah. Uh, using the, the turning acceleration, could you determine the, from what was given the, the acceleration needed for the road runner to turn? Well, we don't have enough information, but you could, you could say something to this effect. We do know the speed of the Roadrunner uh, was down here, 22.9 if I remember. And so we could say, you know, let's say the Roadrunner was going to make a turn. We know at least this much, that it's 22.9. Right, and then if you say, well, this roadrunner is going to make a really sharp turn, so it's raising only one meter, then you can say what acceleration it needs. Or you can say the other way around, it has this much acceleration, what is the radius of the turn? Yeah. But, good question. In fact, I'll do one more example with a projectile, and then we'll do some turning stuff. Because I haven't done any turning ones for you. Uh, well, let's say I'm the roadrunner, 
So if I'm the road runner and I'm coming up to the cliff, um, the acceleration would depend which way I turn. So let me say I turn to my left. So this would probably be the center of the circle here. So my acceleration would be that way, towards the center of the circle. If I'm turning to my right, you know, it would be this. I guess if I was grabbing a tree and turning this, you know, you get the idea. But it, towards the center of the circle, that's why we like to say towards the center of the circle. We don't like to say left, right, north, south, east, up, down. All those can be the center of the circle depending on what circle you have. Yeah. All right, well, my next one, oh, yeah. That, that angle 21 degrees is from like the negative x-axis? Oh, yeah, the way, again, I have labeled it, if you will, from the negative x-axis, the, the angle from the canyon floor, okay. um, which I think is a better description. That's why somebody else was asking earlier. I, I don't think you're better off uh, to always measure things from the positive x-axis. We don't always see things that way. And so to use that in our equations for sines and cosines and always it was that negative 20 I, that one wouldn't be so bad using a negative 20 but here I, I think we're better off to call this 21 degrees as opposed to 159 degrees you know the 21 degrees just kinda makes sense what angle does it well, it's 21 degrees. It, you know, it's the direction the coyote is going, not from the positive x-axis. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you were even a, a, had a tough problem in chapter three with that little robot that was picking something up and and then and then it asked for the angle from the vertical axis. You know, so again, you got to give that some some thought. What is the angle from the uh, vertical axis? In fact, some of you are saying, should I look at that one? Number three? No? No? Okay. <laughs> Alright, so let's so let's do 52 then. I think it's 52. Let me look here. But 52 has got another piece of the same idea here. Now, we got another projectile. And like I said, then we'll get into something different here. Uh, but again, I hopefully you will see the same general principle, same logic, applied with different situations. Make sure you read the math. Here's this one. This one says, a truck loaded with cannonball watermelons stopped. Now maybe I better pause right there. Cannonball watermelons aren't that common in our part of the world. We've got the bigger, juicier watermelons here. And they don't roll really well. But a cannonball one is, looks more like a cannonball and it does roll really well, okay? So that's what you need to know. This thing will roll, okay? Uh, maybe I should call it a cantaloupe for us. You know, we got a big juicy cantaloupe here, right? And, and it's going to fall out of the truck and it's going to roll here. Okay, but a truck loaded with cannonball watermelon stops suddenly to avoid ru running over the edge of a washed out bridge, as shown in the figure. Well, maybe I'll pause there because some of you don't have the book there. This is the, the road. Uh, they've got this ravine that angles down like this. They don't show any more of the ravine. You can imagine it kind of probably curves back up here and has the rest of the road over there. And then they show all this debris at the bottom. This is the bridge. You look carefully at it. There used to be a bridge there and it is now in down into the ravine. And that's, I guess, why the truck is making this sudden stop. So, here is this truck. Loaded with fruit. Stops. One of them rolls and goes over the edge. Okay? All right, so I'll keep reading. The truck loaded with cannonball watermelon stops suddenly to avoid running over the edge of a washed out bridge. The quick stop causes a number of melons to fly off the truck. One melon in particular over the edge in the horizontal direction. Now the cross section of the bank of the ravine has the shape of the bottom half of a parabola 
with its vertex at the edge of the road given by the equation y squared equals 16x, where x and y are 100 meters. What is the y component of where the melon splats in the ravine? Okay, so you read it through, go back and be careful here. So here's the first sentence. First sentence, we got a truck, it stops suddenly, bridge is washed out, makes sense, cannonball's rolling, here goes this rolling cannonball, it says it gets to the edge right there and is launched completely horizontal. So do I know the horizontal speed when it gets launched? Yeah, 10 meters per second, but don't I also know the vertical speed? What's the vertical speed? Zero. So, although they didn't say that explicitly, that was really what they were asking you to interpret into their reading, into their understanding that, hey, this is going horizontal, meaning it's not going vertical and you have zero vertical speed. So they've given me the horizontal speed and they've given me the vertical speed. Now they go on to say that this road, this, I'm sorry, the, the edge of the ravine, they call it the bank. The bank here is a parabola on its on its side. So it's uh, one of the parabolas where y is squared instead of the x is squared. Does that remember that from your math class, right? If you square the x, you get parabolas that look like this, if it's a plus, and like this, if it's a minus. But if you square the y's, then you get this if it's negative, and this if it's positive. And that's what we have, isn't it? Okay, so this is the equation for that. All right, so we, we know something about it. Now the question says, where does the melon land? Well, if I was drawing a picture, I think you would see that it would do something like this, right? Splat. So what are the coordinates? So there's a the problem. All right, so a couple questions. I mean, is it a projectile motion? Do you know the accelerations? Is it a constant acceleration? Yeah. And so maybe I'll start there. Do I know the acceleration? Yeah. What is it? Yeah, zero in the x direction. Okay, so you're making a decision there, but it's 9.8, and I heard somebody say down is negative. Good. We've been always choosing that. that, that that's fine. Uh, I already asked the other ones, do we, do we know the initial velocity in the x direction and the initial velocity in the y direction? Yeah, that's 10 and 0, so we already went through that one. Okay, good. Uh, do we know the initial position? Okay, it depends how we define the origin, where we put the, put the origin. We had been putting it, and I, I don't really see any reason to change, so shall we put the origin where the object gets launched? Yeah, okay, that, that, that makes sense. So let me put that in blue up here so we don't forget it in our minds here. Okay, so there's the launch point. There's the, there's the origin. And of course, the advantage of that is do we know now the initial positions? Yeah, they are. Zero, zero, right? Okay. And so now the question is where does it land? Or does it go splat? All right, well, well what are we going to do? Yeah, we can write out these equations, right? We, we got, we, again, that uh, second kinematic equation is a nice one here. We could write out the x position is equal to the initial x position plus the initial velocity in the y times time plus one half acceleration x t squared. So there's our general equation. Now applied to this case, this is zero. This is 10. And acceleration is zero. So this becomes 10 t equals x. So maybe I'll put a little box around it, but, but that would be the e equation for what is the position of this melon as it's flying through the air as a function of time. In other words, one second later it's gone 10, another second it's 20, 30, 40, 50. At some point it goes splat, so it's not going to keep going forever. But that's the x direction. Could I do the same thing in the y? Sure, so I'll write out the same basic equation in the, in the y direction. And so y equals, and you already told me, do I know the initial position in the y? Yeah. Do I know initial velocity in the y? Yeah. Both of those are zero. Uh, do I know the acceleration? 
Yeah, it's the 9.8, so if I take half of 9.8, I get uh, 4.9. And so I guess I would call this equation number two, if you will. Now what? So can I solve this for x and y? How many equations do I have? How many unknowns do I have? Three. Do I know X? Do I know Y? Do I know T? So don't forget your basic math, right? Three equations that are needed to solve for three unknowns. So before I spend two hours doing homework and homework and getting nowhere, Make sure I step back and look. What, what, what else do I need here? Any suggestions? Good. Live, you see. I do have a third one, don't I? Isn't this one over here? Ah, oh, so that's the other thing. This is the equation of this parabola. And so I've got three equations, three unknowns. So, yes, I really do have three equations. I just didn't want you to forget this. And so let's, let's start solving them. Uh, some of you said already, even before we pointed out to that one, you said, well, we could eliminate time here. Sure, fair enough. I'll solve that for time and put it into here. So solving this for time means I've got x over 10. Putting it into here means y equals minus 4.9, and then I'll put an x squared over 100. Because I square my, my time, which gives me a negative, uh, and I guess i got to move it two decimal places, x squared. So those two equations become one equation, right? And so I've eliminated time, which is probably a good step because now I've got those two became one. And then can I put it with that one over there? So maybe I'll solve this for y. If I solve this for y, what do I get? y equals 4 times the square root of x. And so if I put that into here, This becomes 4 times the square root of x equals a negative 0.049x squared. And then I can solve for x, right? But I got a huge mistake there, and I can do my math right, but I'm just going to foul it up. What did I do wrong? Oh, there's a plus or minus over here. Do I want both? Do I want the plus one or the minus one? How do I know I want the minus one? Yeah, I want the bottom half of a parabola. God, it would be so much easier if they just tell me it was the negative one. Oh, man, I hate when they do that. They didn't. They say you want the bottom half of a parabola. That's your clue. You know the equation for a parabola. Read the math. Look closely at it here. You, when, this, when this thing lands over here, x is positive, but y is negative. So you need to put a positive x, take its square root, and get a negative y. This is the bottom half of a parabola. So treat it as one. And so I really need a negative sign here. And so that would have been my error. I could have easily just kind of overlooked that if I wasn't reading the math. I was just kind of doing the math, right? And so that's got a, a negative sign in there. Although I guess I could have done some other substitutions and, and avoided that. But I, but I did want to address that. All right. And of course, what's really nice about that is now I got a negative on both sides. So what happens there? Yeah, yeah, so then they're going to 
cancel off here. Okay. And so now I've got a bunch of work to do. Uh, now it depends how you want to do this. Um, I guess we could square both sides or we could just raise that to a three house power. Anybody care? Square both sides? So that, that, that's what I hear most of you? Okay. Uh, why don't I move this over first? Let's go 4 divided by 0 0.049 and then square root of x is equal to x squared and then see what that is. Um, 4 divided by 0 0.049. Uh, that's about an 81, 6. So 81, 6 square root of x is equal to x squared. Um, you know, he said square it, so I'll square it. I'm not real crazy about that, but that's cool. All right, so 6, 6, 6, 4, x is equal to x to the fourth. This is always a fun one. What's the next step? So divide by x? Okay, so you're really, yeah, you're really doing, the, you're dividing by an x, right? And you're saying 6, 6, 6, 4 is equal to x cubed, except, yeah, this doesn't work when x is 0, right? So you have to check, is x equal to 0 a solution? <laughs> yeah, it is, but not really relevant to us, right? I mean, did the, did the watermelon exist at x equal to 0? I mean, is there a solution here? Yeah, x equals to zero is a solution where y equals to zero, where time equals to zero. So, yes, the watermelon crossed at zero, zero at time equals to zero. That's that one. So, yeah, it's a solution. So, I'm glad I checked for it, but it's not the one I really want. So, if I didn't check for it, I guess I'd get okay this time. But it's this one here that I'm interested in, the positive one, the non-zero one. So, I'll keep going and now take the cube root. So, raised to a power of one-third gives me about an 18. So I got an 18.8 meters for x. And then of course once I know x, I could get y in a lot of different ways. Here, 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 or here. I'll just go over to here. And so I will take the square root of that and multiply it by a negative 4 and get about a negative 17. So negative 17.4 meters and although they didn't ask for time why not do it here because the time would be x divided by 10 so there's x divided by 10 and your 1.88 seconds so the watermelon will hit 1.88 seconds away this will be the parameters of the x and y coordinates when it hits oh uh, yeah I put x into this one but there's no reason I couldn't have put x into here to get time and then put time into here to get y. Or put x into here and get y. I mean, usually towards the end of a problem, I've got so much information. Part C's and D's are pretty easy to do. Well, for me, how's that? <laughs> you know, because, you know, by the time you get there, you've got so many different pieces. It's, you know, kind of setting up what you, what you do. Did I see another question? Okay, fair enough. And man, please don't ever think while I'm up here doing it like this is the only way you, you can do it, you know. Uh, you know, uh, I will be looking for sound logic. And, uh, and I would be surprised if, you know, out of all 60 of you in class, if any two of you did exactly the same. Most of you will probably do the most common ways, true. But some people will go off this way and that way. And, you know, that's why I just got to sit down and I got to read each step and say, now what are they doing? and try to understand what you're, you're doing. In fact, I would encourage you, try to make it as clear as possible because, you know, I want to make sure that I understand what's going on in your head. If you don't write it down, I can't give you any partial credit for it. But if you write it down and it's logically sound, I can say, well, you know what? Even though the answer's way off, they were really on the right step and they really just fouled up here. You know, they picked the wrong sign there. You know, their answer looks horribly off, but they're really not that bad. You know, they, they, they just picked the wrong uh, parabola. And that was probably more of carelessness than really lack of knowledge. And, and, and you know, that's, that's, not, that's not a, that big of a deal to me. 
And so you'll get a lot of partial credit for that. Um, what if we had to like, translate the, uh, the equation modeling that Like, you know how it's set Oh, so they tell you? Origin, yeah. What if it was like a uh, middle of the problem? Well, I guess I can't answer that directly. I mean, they would have to tell you enough information so you could come up with the equation. Is that what you're kind of after? And how do we know to set where to set our origin? Oh, actually, that's a very good question, too. Um, remember, we picked the origin at the launch point here. And then we jumped over and used their equation. So when we go to jump and use their equation, we better make sure we understand Oh, I can study this equation and figure it out. They make it very clear. They said the vortex or vertex, excuse me, is where it, you know, at the at the edge of the washed out point. Watch, I mean, look at the wording here. What do they say here? Okay, the parabola with a vertex at the edge of the road. And if you remember from your math class, you probably written this more like that. Where the origin is, or the vertex, is at HK, right? So our H is zero and our K is zero. So they are saying that that point is zero, zero. It's the same zero, zero we picked. I'm glad you pointed that out because they could have given me equation that is in reference to a different origin than I used. And if I just run over and use their equation, oh, it's all messed up. And I, and I oh, I, I, I could foul that out in a heartbeat without even thinking about it. Kind of reminds me of Nassid and Lockheed. I mean, Lockheed did all these great calculations, launched the rocket for NASA, said, here it is, it's on its way to Mars, here's the numbers. And NASA says, thank you very much, we'll take it from here. And then they start doing it, next thing they know it, plows into the surface of Mars. Why? Their numbers were in miles. NASA assumed those numbers were in kilometers. Simple as that. $125 million mistake, right there. Okay. So you got to communicate, you got to be understanding what's going on. You can't just say, oh, here it is. You know, oh, here's an equation. That's why I, you know, I joke with you, but I'm very serious about, you know, if all you do is plug and chug, you can only do something that's been done before. And you'll run into all kinds of, of troubles. It, you, you, you won't succeed well. You got to understand how all these pieces fit together. And if you don't read it, you'll, oh, you'll do okay. You'll get an okay grade. You'll transfer to an okay school. You'll have an okay career with an okay salary, with an okay spouse, with okay kids. You know, it, 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 it just, it, it, there's so much more to it, you know, and it's, you know, if you give me the equation for the elasticity of an O-ring and I put it on a space shuttle and I launch it and don't even bother to check that the elasticity doesn't apply when it gets freezing, I'll launch it when it's freezing and blow up seven people. You know, I mean, these are the kind of things that happen when you're a little bit... Careless. You, you, you computer programs, it's really common. Oh, here's a program, here's a program, I'll copy and paste this information into here. Oh, if you don't understand all these details about how this feeds data from this part of the program, you put it together, there's bugs all over the place. You know, and they just, they just don't work right. And uh, so that's, that's the dilemma between just getting something done and, you know, thriving. You know, it's a big difference. Yeah? Can you get time without that equation? Time without what equation? This one? I don't think so. Because the time would, there would be one time when it's here, there'll be another time when it's here, there'll be another time when it's here. There's only one time when it crosses this shape. Not without this equation, because I need that equation to say, where does it cross the shape? This is the equation that mathematically describes that shape. So without this shape, I have an, a, uh, you might say, an infinite number of solutions. I've got one second, two seconds. I could tell you where the melon is after one second, it's here. I could tell you where the melon is after two seconds, it's here. Have you found the parabola, the projector, the parabola of the projectile mass? Oh yeah, and I did. This is the equation for the parabola right there. I put what you might call a parametric plot together. So this is the equation for this parabola. And then when I combine it with that equation, I have found the intersection of those two parabolas. So this parabola intersects with that parabola at two locations. 
One of them is here, and the other one was the zero zero we talked about. So if you have picked the top part of the, the side X parabola, what would you get? Because they never intersect. Right, so you get no solution. You'd say, well, they never intersect. It never hits. And hopefully it would bother you. I mean, basically what you're saying is if this, you know, if you would have a negative on that side and a positive on that side, and you would say, when does this positive number ever equal that negative number? Never. Right? Yeah. Good. Good questions. Real good questions. You're reading the math. You're, you're studying it. You're looking at the details of those equations. Well, I told you we should do some circular ones. And uh, so we didn't get too far today. So I guess that will tell me that on Wednesday we'll even do more here. But I've got two circular ones here. Uh, how about 29 for our first uh, circular one? Here we've got a train making a turn. Yeah. On the test, if we had a question like that, would it be like look down upon to graph it on your calculator to solve that near, for that intercept mm -hmm. between like the two Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I don't know how to answer that one. Um, my <laughs> yeah, uh, because it is a solution. I, I I wouldn't mark anything wrong. I. Uh, uh, oh. uh, but there also, yeah, there also wouldn't be any work, so. I drew the graph, but. I won't do it if it's. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that wasn't, certainly wasn't the uh, in, intent uh, of it. But I, I would suspect that you would probably have written enough down that you would have that parabola. And you would certainly have to do all this to come up with that parabola. And then the only thing you really did on your calculator, so I guess that's not that big of a deal, is, is, is set the two functions on your calculator instead of doing that. And that's not that big of a deal. Okay. Um, I, I guess I would rather you see that, but I wouldn't take anything off for it. Right. How's that? <laughs> because you did, you did solve it with a graphical means. And, and uh, so... Well, 29 then is uh, our first one going in a circle here. Here it says a train slows down as it rounds a sharp horizontal turn. Slowing from 90 kilometers per hour down to 50 kilometers per hour in 15 seconds. That's the end. The radius of the curvature is 150 meters. Compute the acceleration at the moment the train reaches 50 kilometers per hour. Go ahead and assume that the train slows down to a uniform rate. Okay? All right, so read it all the way through, come back and go, okay, what do I have? Well, it looks like we've got a, a train that's making this bend. They said that the radius, if I remember right, was 150 meters. So 150 meters is the radius of this turn. Now it is slowing down, keep that in mind. So the train maybe starts here going at 90 kilometers per hour. Slows down, slows down, slows down, slows down. And when it gets here, it's going 50 kilometers per hour. Okay? So it's constantly slowing. And there's a very important sentence at the moment here. What does this mean here? Assume that the slowing down is uniform through 15. Constant. Yeah, at least a constant magnitude in slowing down. Two dimensions, it always the same direction. Let's draw a picture here. When the train is, say, right here, what's the direction of the acceleration vector? Maybe I'll do it in blue. Is it towards the center? I'll draw a dotted line towards the center. Is it this? No. It's that, why? It's slowing and turning, right? We need a little bit of both. We need, as somebody pointed out, this part, which I will call the radial acceleration. This is the V squared over R. This is the, the part it needs to, to turn. And then it needs what your author calls A sub T for either transverse or tangential part of it, but it's the part that is then changing its, its speed. 
Let's look at it a little bit later. In fact, the whole question centers of when it gets to here. So even though what I said is true, not really important. What's important is right here. Right here. What's the direction of the acceleration right there? Okay, same kind of picture in that it has a radial component of V squared over R and a tangential component. But will it be the same magnitude and will it be the same direction? No. no. So when I asked, is this a constant acceleration problem, it was much deeper than that. It wasn't just yes or no. What is the same in those two pictures? The tangential part, right? The slowing down part. Is the radial part the same? No, why not? Yeah, the V squared over R is different. You see, when the train is right here, it needs a lot of radial acceleration. It's going really fast. But when the train is here, it doesn't need much radial part. It's got a slower speed. So you don't have the same amount of radial. The radial keeps changing because your speed keeps changing. You might say it's easier to turn here when you're going slow than when you are turning here when you're going fast. But the tangential part is the same. So really what the author has said here is a tangential is a constant. But a radial does not equal a constant. And even if a radial did equal a constant, would it be the same direction as we are making this turn? No, you can even see that in the picture. I mean, even if these arrowheads that I've drawn are the same size, here it's pointing kind of down at this corner. Here it's kind of pointing up at that corner. And so the direction of the acceleration is, is, is different. Even if the magnitudes were, were the same. So I, I wanted you to kind of look at that. I, it wasn't really so much of a question of is this a constant acceleration problem, yes or no. It was, do, do you see the components? Do you see the little subtleties? Do you see why this is two-dimensional motion? Do you see how it's a step more complicated than the one-dimensional motion? Do you see how we have to look at both dimensions, both things that are going on? We have to look at the part that's turning and the part that is slowing. Okay? And that's the, the point of this chapter, two-dimensional motion, and the point of, of picking out this, this problem. Because the tangential is a constant, and I can calculate that one, I think, really simple. That one changes its speed. So this would just be the change in speed over the change in time. Since it is a constant, I don't have to think of it as a derivative, do I? It's the whole change in speed over the whole change in time. You might say that's average, but if something doesn't change, its average is the same as its instantaneous, right? And so that's how we get away with this. We're not going to try to take a derivative. Did you catch that? Don't try to take a derivative here. Understand what the derivative would be saying. A, if something always had the same derivative, right, it has a constant value. And so a constant value. If everybody on the test scores 95, guess what the average in the class is? 95, right? And so the average and the instant become one in the same. And so there's a little subtlety there, and so that's kind of nice here. So I can do this. I can get the change in speed. What is the change in speed? Well, I guess it's 90 kilometers per hour minus 50 kilometers per hour in 15 seconds. So the change in speed, and notice I didn't pay much attention to final minus initial or initial minus final. I'm just going to get the, the number. Obviously, it's opposite to the direction it's moving. That's why it is slowing down. But the change in speed here, then, is 40 kilometers per hour in 15 seconds. And so that's the first half of the problem. Although, you can kind of see we've also got a unit conversion issue. So, as I said, we got to take things from chapter one and apply it here in chapter four. So let me do the unit conversion. How do I change kilometers into meters? Well, just put in the value of the K. The K means a thousand. Could you just 
change hours into seconds? Sure. How do I change hours into seconds? Yeah, so just substitute one hour and replace it with 3,600 seconds. So I said it at the beginning, treat your units and your numbers with the same rule. So do a substitution. How many seconds are in an hour? Replace hour, do a substitution. One hour equals 3,600 seconds. So that's probably the easiest unit conversion you can do, substitute. Okay, don't do too much thought on it, just substitute your your units here. So with that in mind, maybe I'll take that first one which is 1000 and divide it by 3600. So there's a, a number, multiply it by 40 in the front and whatever number I get there divided by 15 coming up with 0.74. So 0 0.74 meters per second squared. And so there would be the tangential acceleration. How do I get the radial acceleration? Well, the radial acceleration is the velocity squared divided by its radius. That's why we said it changed depending on where it is. That's why it was real important here that the author tell you where do you want me to calculate this instantaneous acceleration. You see the tangential that I just calculated is the same all the way across. So I just calculated the average, but I can also say that that's it's instantaneous here, 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 here. But its radial keeps changing because its velocity keeps changing. And so they said find it at this point. Alright, so I will put 50 kilometers per hour squared over 150 meters. Now of course I have a unit conversion thing. So this is 50. This is 1000 meters over 3600 seconds and it's this whole thing squared divided by 150 meters. And that will come out then in meters per second squared. So there's my unit con conversion again here. So I've got 50 times a thousand divided by 3600. Square that, divide it by 150 and this is about a 1.29 meters per second squared. And almost done. I know we're almost out of time too, so perfect here. They asked for, let me maybe come back and read it carefully. I don't think they asked for the component, so I don't think I'm done. Compute the acceleration. They want to know the total acceleration. So what do I have? Well, I have how much is radial and how much is tangential. How do I get the total? Yeah, Pythagorean's theorem, right? The total then comes out to be the square root of 0.74 squared plus 1.29 squared. And so 0.74 squared plus 1.29 squared equals, and the square root of all of that then is 1.49. So I think they want that for the number. That's the total acceleration. And then they're going to want a direction, so there's got to be some angle, theta. Well, there's where a decision needs to be made. Where do you want to measure the angle from? From that direction? Okay, fair enough. You could have done it from many other places, but just make it very clear how you are calling theta. Put it in your diagram and then give me a theta. Give me a direction. So, in this case, I would say the tangent of theta is the tangential acceleration over the radial acceleration. So theta is inverse tangent of 0.74 over 1.29 inverse tangent 0.74 1.29 and we're looking at about 29.8 degrees. So roughly 30 degrees is the direction of that acceleration from the, from the radius. 30 degrees from radially in. 
120 from the direction it's traveling. Yeah, you know, I'll take any of those answers. Both are certainly uh, correct. All right, well, hopefully that was a little enlightening. Keep working on these.